Now that you've read the story, I wanted to return to a few points that we might reflect on together. Throughout Haywood's novella, we see Fantomina take on a number of different roles, like an actress, returning to the theatrical theme from the story's beginning. Fantomina is herself a role, uh, pretending to be a sex worker, and then a lady that is like, but not exactly herself. When Beau seems to tire of Fantomina, she decides to keep his interest by posing as Celia, a maid, it works, but he continues to tire of one woman and never stays faithful, so she invents another persona, Mrs. Bloomer, the widow, and finally the masked woman she calls Incognita. Now, the narrator tells us that we can't really blame Beau for not seeing through the acts, because Fantomina is admirably skilled in the art of feigning, pretending, and more talented than an actor due to these aids from nature, joined to the wiles of art. Now, this is perhaps a callback to male writers who insisted women were naturally deceptive, nature, but it also describes a skill set art uh, that all women must in a way learn to make their way through the world to be who society demands that you be phantomina finds a way to use that knowledge of how women of different classes are supposed to look and act and twist it to her own devices rather than being trapped by it so as a result Haywood offers some valuable insight into how women of different class and social positions were treated by men, potentially. So when we compare Fantomino's roles of the sex worker and the maid versus how she's treated as a presumably upper-class widow, the differences are stark. And the narrator underscores this directly. When Beau Placer, uh, his moves he's putting on the widow um, are described as being notably different uh, than how he treated Fantomina and Celia. He did not offer, as he had done to Fantomina and Celia, to urge his passion directly to her, but by a thousand little softening artifices, which he well knew how to use, gave her leave to guess he was enamored. So we see this distinction between forceful and expectant that he will get what he wants with Celia and Fantomina versus his treatment of the widow. He waits for signs from her. He moves in stages. And then, of course, he also treats not just Fantomina as a sex worker, but in a sense, Celia too. He offers her money afterwards as well. So he pays Fantomina and Celia. Um, but in the case of the widow, in another story, he might have expected to receive gifts from her instead. Uh, but something particularly important to note here is how Celia the maid is presented. So when Fantomina is going to the inn and getting the job as Celia the maid, uh, we learn something I think it's maybe easy to pass over, but is pretty significant here. We're told that she's fortunate because there were no others of the male sex in the house but an old gentleman who had lost the use of his limbs and her beloved Beau Placer, so that she was in no apprehensions of any amorous violence, but where she wished to find it. And so the expectation here is that a maid would be subject to rape from any man in the house, potentially, which is alarming. So literature, however fictional, often reflects the society in which it's written. And here we see a pretty... Uh, accurate and alarming portrayal of the different social strata of women and how that affected their bodily autonomy and the basic respect they were or were not given. Now, Haywood also uses these different roles, these different personas that Fantomina takes on to show how she grows as a character when it comes to freely exploring and vocalizing her sexuality. 
So uh, when we have Celia, we see kind of a move uh, beyond Phantomina. She's answering Beau Placer's flirtations with seeming innocence, which means the appearance of innocence, uh, but we know she no longer is. Uh, we're told that she wished to find amorous violence, uh, which is odd terminology. It might not actually mean violence, but uh, maybe it does. It's difficult language in this story. And then we're told that when she is engaging with Bobo Sierra, she is half yielding, half reluctant. And so there's a mixture there of reluctance and participation or yielding. So still with Celia, we are in a position that is perhaps uncomfortable. And this is, interestingly enough, the most detailed, um, I think, sex scene in the story. And it's one that is still skirting the lines of consent. Uh, for all that Beau Placer knows, she is not willing. Um, but we know, at least behind the scenes, that uh, Phantomina has orchestrated this scene but there's still this uncertainty uh, here. But as we move on to the character of the Widow Bloomer, we're seeing a much more assertive, uh, in part because of the role that a widow is expected to no longer be a virgin. And so it may be that how Phantomina uh, behaves as Celia is how she expects a real Celia would behave, that she understands these different roles of women and plays them very deliberately. But as the Widow Bloomer, we see more detail, more agency, more active sexuality. She openly discusses with Beau Placer uh, the unspeakable ecstasy of those who meet with equal ardency. So we're looking at a more equal playing field, the fact that both partners would desire one another. She doesn't sleep with Beau Placer right away. Instead, she pretends that she faints. And why does she do that? Not to avoid him precisely, but she tells us that she didn't think it decent for the character she had assumed to yield so suddenly and unable to deny his and her own inclinations. This is her solution. So she's telling us that she wants to sleep with him here, but she knows her character wouldn't right away. And so this is a very, very interesting, uh, deliberate performance uh, that Phantomina is engaging in, which shows on her part, and certainly Haywood's part, um, a careful studying of people. And then the description of the dynamic between the Widow Bloomer and Beau Placer. Uh, we're told that they pass the time of their journey in as much happiness as the most luxurious gratification of wild desires could make them. And so here they seem to meet equally in their desire. And then the final form of uh, Phantomina's evolution is Incognita, the masked woman. And here, you know, by the time she becomes incognita, she sees no reason to hide her desires anymore. Uh, it says uh, it would have been a ridiculous piece of affectation, of pretend, in her to have seemed coy in complying with what she herself had been the first in desiring. She yielded without even a show of reluctance, and if there be any true felicity in an amour such as theirs, both here enjoyed it to the full. So even though she so at this point, Phantomina has determined that she can throw away uh, these kind of social scripts and just get what she wants. Uh, she sees, again, no reason to hide her desire and to achieve uh, her satisfaction. Uh, now, she does still literally hide her face, however, as the masked woman, because this story is a fantasy, uh, but it still stays in touch with reality. A real woman in this era cannot do what Phantomina does. Um, in her story, Haywood offers a space for experimentation, for this kind of freedom to be explored. 
Uh, and in so doing, she challenges what the typical heterosexual relationship of this period uh, would look like uh, in giving Fantomina this more active role. Now, Bope Sayre is intended to be kind of a stock character, representing a sort of man who loves him and leaves him. Of course, he does not represent every man, but he does represent the freedom to be this kind of man in this society. As readers, we may question why Fantomina puts up with this and continues to pursue him. Here's where Haywood is perhaps most vocal and rebellious. Reflecting on his kind of trying to keep his various affairs going uh, with both Fantomina and the widow Bloomer, Fantomina scoffs at Beauplacere's behavior and feels bad for the women whose hearts get broken by such men, but she's indicating that that's not her that she understands now. And so after she gets letters addressed to both Fantomina and the widow, uh, she, she knows he's writing to both of them. He's setting up dates with both of them. He's sleeping with both of them. Uh, she says, traitor, as soon as she had read them, tis thus our silly, fond, believing sex are served when they put faith in man. So had I been deceived and cheated, had I, like the rest, believed and sat down mourning in absence and vainly waiting recovered tendernesses? So just saying, had I been like other women, but I'm not, I'm not doing that. She asks, how do some women make their life a hell, burning in fruitless expectations and dreaming out their days and hopes and fears, then wake at last to all the horror of despair? But I have outwitted even the most subtle of the deceiving kind, and while he thinks to fool me, is himself the only beguiled person. And then the narrator tells us how satisfied she is with this kind of realization. She's like, okay, this is how Beauplacer works. I am going to go into this eyes wide open. So we learn that she made herself most certainly extremely happy in the reflection on the success of her stratagems. And while the knowledge of his inconstancy and levity of nature kept her from having that real tenderness for him she would else have had, she found the means of gratifying the inclination she had for his agreeable person in as full a manner as she could wish. She had all the sweets of love, but as yet had tasted none of the gall, and was in a state of contentment which might be envied by the more delicate. Here Fantomina establishes that she has arisen above what most women suffer now that she feels she understands how men work. She indicates that she doesn't actually love Beauplacere, saying that now that she's seen his behavior, she doesn't have the tenderness for him that she might have otherwise. But she still finds their affairs gratifying and wants to continue sleeping with him, basically. She thinks she has it all figured out. Of course, this kind of confidence is what often precedes a hero's downfall in a story, and by the end of this story, things do catch up with Fantomina. However, her ending may not be the unhappy punishment that similar women have met in similar stories. Let's return to the scholarly article I quoted at the start of the video. Uh, here, Catherine Kraft offers us one possible interpretation of the ending, arguing that while it might not seem like a victorious one, it's actually a lot better than other novels about fallen women. So Catherine Kraft writes, the denial of the marriage ending, that is the lack of a marriage at the end, happy ever after, may seem a punishment that cancels out the celebration of a heroine who manages to achieve authority over herself. Haywood makes clear in her tale, though, that marriage with this hero is a consummation devoutly not to be wished. This story, the narrator warns, is proof of men's guile. Deception. Matrimony is not, nor should be, the proper resolution of Fantomina's story. The only authority to which Fantomina must answer is not the booming voice of a tyrannical father, but the restraint of a virtuous mother. When she finds herself with child, 
She knows that she can easily impose on credulous men, but now all her invention was at a loss for a stratagem to impose on a woman of her mother's penetration. She gives birth to a fine girl. When Beauplacer offers to take this newborn lady and rear her, both mother and daughter refuse his offer. A community of women is established at the end of Haywood's text, and Fantamina's trip to a monastery in France, the abbess of which had been her particular friend, far from being a punishment, is rather a continuation of that female society. For Eliza Haywood's convent, like that of the galloping nuns envisioned by Aphra Ben in The Fair Jilt, uh, another novel by um, another amorous fiction writer, uh, seems a place where Fantamina's pleasures and freedom will suffer no abatement. So Kraft proposes that this is not an unhappy ending and is not a punishment for Fantamina. She gets to go be with other women and to seek another path than a mother or wife. Of course, this is one person's interpretation, and there is room for many more, including yours. I look forward to potentially hearing your thoughts on Fantamina in this week's discussion.